uh, with no further ado, I'll give the word to, to Sandra. Please, Sandra, you have the stage. Thank you very much. I am going to share with you the screen of my computer. I hope everybody can see now my PowerPoint, my presentation. If not, please let me know. Uh, I would like to start by saying, um, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And thank you very much for the organizing committee for this invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this workshop and to be with all of you, uh, although in the distance. Um, the starting point of my paper lies in the following assertion. Maps made in Europe during the Middle Ages and the early modern period give a great prominence to the image of the other. These maps are full of characters, either referred in written form or depicted. They are different from Europeans in physical appearance or unusual customs and inhabit other regions, often distant and exotic. Within the wide and diverse cartographic production of this period, otherness is particularly explicit in the so-called Portland charts due to their close relationship with navigation and the discovery of the world. In fact, just such is the importance of otherness in this type of maps that Kreskes Abraham, the famous Jewish cartographer from Mallorca, attributed author of the well-known Catalan Atlas, defined the term Mapamundi in this work as the image of the world and of the different periods of the world and of the regions on earth and of the different types of people that live in it. The philosophical starting point that underlies the birth of the idea of otherness shows the existence of an opposing binomial, self versus other. The self, in our case study, the European, constructs the other in order to define itself, to build its own identity. For the self, this other acquires the value of a mirror in which to look at, to construct not only the identity of the other, but also one's own identity. Many historiographical contributions on alterity have made use of the simile of the mirror. The other is a mirror in which the self is reflected. In turn, as far as we are concerned, maps are for us mirrors that reflect this construction, this invention of otherness. Maps are an open window to the world in the past, but it is necessary to know how to read them. In this paper, I will focus on some specific representations on European maps that show how and why the image of the other peoples and their other territories they inhabit are constructed. I will deal with maps from the Renaissance as this is the period in which, in the words of the French uh, historian Jules Michelet, the discovery of the world, the discovery of the human being took place. There are many examples on maps from the 16th century that show this invention of the other. I recently discussed in another seminar how 16th and 17th century maps from Dieppe, France, used the woodcut in a printed book commemorating the entry of King Henry II into Rouen in 1550. The maps copied the details of this woodcut, which presented an idealized Brazil that offered benefits to a possible alliance between the French and the Tupinamba. For this workshop, and in order to fit the time constraint, I will stick to specific images depicted in the African continent, both in the Cantino Mapamundi, probably a Portuguese manuscript map of around 1502, and the Caverio Mapamundi of circa 1505, Cantino's younger sister chart, as Gregory McIntosh called it, made by a Jewish cartographer. Finally, the idea of presenting this topic within the discussion on the origin and evolution of the nautical chart is to highlight the importance of including images in the analysis of the creation of maps, since they belong to another kind of repertoire that cartographers handled. And with these images, 
cartographers, as has already been demonstrated, could do much more than embellish their works. In his study of Caverius Mapamundi, Edward Stevenson stated that nowhere on his chart does Canerio explicitly tell us the source or sources of this information. It is reasonable to assume that in part they were the written record descriptions of expeditions both to the west and the east. There must indeed have been much of this material, official and unofficial, to which chart makers had access in that day, but there are few of these records extant which were then available. Stevenson was concerned with the sources used by this cartographer, but in his effort to identify them, he did not take into consideration the borrowing of images or the visual these sources that inspired the motifs included in his map. It was 1908 when textual sources were the focus on the analysis of maps. Fortunately, things have improved for the artistic content of cartography. For the topic we are interested in, the main work is Sharika Davis' Renaissance Ethnography and the Invention of the Human New Worlds, Maps and Monsters, published by Cambridge University Press in 2016. The iconographical construction of the other on maps may have its origin in the cartographer's empirical ignorance of foreign people and their territories, as well as in an erroneous interpretation of the sources cartographers used. It seems to be the case of many images that accompanied toponyms on nautical charts, that is, the geographical names often of Western origin with which Europeans renamed the conquered lands. If we turn our attention to the African Atlantic coast, for example, we frequently find Sierra Leona shaped in the image of a, of a lion, the animal that gives name to that mountain. Frequently, as a rampant lion sticking out its tongue, thus following the heraldic typology and consequently assuming a non-naturalistic appearance. Although lions are not originally from that region, this animal ended up giving it a name. The Italian Alvise da Cadamosto, author of a travel account written in the 1460s explained that the mountain Leoness is the skull due to the great noise of the thunder that can be heard continuously from the clouds that always surround the summit. For his part, Duarte Pacheco Pereira denied in his Emeraldo de Situorbis that it was so named because there were lions there, but because it was a wild and raged country. Regardless of the etymological origin of the toponym, what I would like to point out is that these maps silence any explanation of the name. Instead, the image of a lion appears on the territory. In the absence of such an explanation, the presence of the animal could easily be assimilated as part of the fauna of that place, just as in the African continent, we find giraffes elephants and exotic birds on the same maps. Another example of misinterpretation can be found in Cantino's world map, specifically in the Gulf of Guinea in the region of modern Nigeria, where there is a river called Rio dos Forzados that can be translated as River of the Forked. As Pacheco Pereira explains, its name is due to the fact that when it was discovered, many very large birds were found here with forked tails like swallows. In Cantino World Map, close to Rio dos Forzados, there are four big birds, gray color with orange tails, which, however, do not allude to the birds described by Pacheco Pereira, but rather to the brown parrots that, according to a legend close to them, are abundant in the kingdom of Benin. Closer to the Rio dos Forzados, there is a very different depiction, only present in this map. 
a gallows on which three people have been executed. It is interesting to note that the three executed figures are Africans, exactly like, like, like the black silhouettes around the Castello da Mina. Although there were executions in the context of African slave market, I do not know of a contemporary source that the anonymous cartographer may have used, and it seems very likely that the image of the gallows may have derived from a linguistic mistake. The cartographer must have read Rio dos Forzados and associated the term with forca, gallows, from the Latin furca. By incorporating this image, he invented this death sentence of three Africans with a Western instrument of execution whose existence dates back to Roman antiquity. It is not strange to think that the cartographer misinterpreted the toponym, perhaps under the influence of other surrounding toponyms that allude to the difficult relations between the Europeans and the native African population, such as the Rio dos Escravos, of which Pacheco Pereira explains its etymology. Two slaves were obtained there by barter when it was discovered, hence its name. These two examples of illustrated toponyms show how ignorance was eluded with invention or how other people and other territories were constructed. The point of emphasizing an exotic and dangerous otherness on maps relies in the pleasure of contemplating them. The book named The Governor, written by the English diplomat and researcher Sir Thomas Eliot, assures the importance of cosmology in the education of those who were to occupy high positions in society. This use of maps was compatible with enjoyment. What incredible delight is taken in beholding the diversities of people, beasts, fools, fishes, trees, fruits, and herbs, to know the sundry manners and conditions of people and the variety of their natures, and that in the warm studio of further without peril of the sea or danger of long and painful journeys. In addition to being a source of delight, the images were often used to fill in blank spaces which were unknown. To avoid empty spaces, many cartographers strove to fill them with motifs, and for this very reason, sometime later, Jonathan Swift, the satirist, author best known for Gulliver's Travels, criticized in On Poetry, a Rhapsody, that African was filled with images that contributed to turning it into a savage territory. So geographers in Africa maps with savage pictures fill their gaps. And their in in inhabitable downs place elephants for want of towns. With this quote, we now turn our attention to the image of the African elephant and its trainer in the world map by Caverio. Despite its large dimensions, 225 by 115 centimeters, this illustration is the one of is one of the few images and one of the largest, which gives it a special uniqueness on the map. As a result of this study, I have been able to locate the representation that directly or indirectly inspired the illustration of the South African character driving an elephant. The presence of elephants in Africa goes back to medieval nautical portlands long before Caverio included his in this map. In her study of animals on maps, William George states that in the 14th century, Africa was linked to the elephant. This animal appears in the chart of Angelino da Lord and Angelino Dulcerge, and in the 16th century, it was still a symbol of this continent. An elephant appears, for example, well in Martin Wilson Miller's map of the world of 1507. Despite its long survival in Africa, the image of the elephant underwent a geographical shift. From the Egyptian region on late medieval maps, it migrated to the south, possibly a Portuguese, as possibly as Portuguese exploration of the continent progressed. It is here in southern Africa, close to the mountains of the Mob, that we find the elephant in 16th century maps. The image of the elephant on Caverio's map is the most complex image of this animal to be found on maps. 
Most represent the animal in isolation, but Caderio accompanies it with a character who leads the animal by pulling a rope tied around its neck. Likewise, while 14th century nautical charts included elephants among the African monstrous fauna, Animalia monstruosa, in Caderio's map, this animal becomes a domesticated animal, possibly used for the transport of goods. In fact, Stevenson describes the image as a, as a Mohammedan trader with his elephant carrying a burden of merchandise. The turban explains his identification as a Muslim. By loading the elephant with goods, Caberio deprives this animal of the traditional tower or castle carried by the elephants in previous nautical charts. Following the medieval iconography of the animal, which goes back to the Bible, where it is said that animals, these animals were used in war. This belief endured throughout antiquity as it is recorded, for example, by Pliny in his natural history and passed into the Middle Ages, being echoed by numerous texts, such as the etymologies of Saint Isidore or bestiaries. The warlike character of elephants is also evoked in late medieval maps. The Mapamundi Catalan Estense, attributed to Pere Rosel around uh, mid 15th century, said of the Indian Sultan of Delhi that he was a great and powerful Sultan who commands, when marching against his enemies, 700 trained elephants. By placing an elephant in Africa, Caverio prolonged a tradition in nautical charts, but however, he opted for an unconventional image. The many differences of this motif with previous nautical charts lies in the source he used, an engraving by the German Ludwig Schungauer, specifically the elephant and his trainer. Although both images are very similar, there are some differences that can be explained by the fact that Caverio was probably not directly familiar with Ludwig Schungauer's work, but instead another in, there was another intermediate work also derived from the German engraving. Caveria shows the mirror image of Ludwig Schongauer and both elephants reveal differences in the treatment of the tusks, trunk, tail, and legs. It is curious to note that Caveria's animal is more naturalistic and it even includes some details that Ludwig Schongauer omits. For example, the representation of the sex and the two nostrils of the trunk. It is possible to identify the species on the map as an Africa savanna elephant, Loxodonta africana, characterized by its three-toed hoofed feet. The legs of Ludwig Schongauer's elephant with two distinct toes are more similar to those of a camel. These differences suggest that Caverio or the possible intermediate artist so a real elephant. Ludwig Schongauer, however, must have been inspired by another image of the animal, perhaps the engraving of his brother, Martin Schongauer. All the other details, specifically the cargo of goods and the portrait of the merchant are so similar between the two images that there can be no doubt Caverio's dependence on Ludwig Schongauer's engraving. The two figures show the same posture, lead the animal in the same manner and are dressed identically with high boots, a back tied at the waist and a turban. Jane Campbell Hutchinson has suggested that Ludwig Schengauer's engraving is also dependent on another by his brother, Mas Martin, Moore's in conversation. For this latter engraving, Martin Schongauer may have been inspired by Muslims he saw on a trip he apparently made to Spain. Thus, if a Spanish Muslim was certainly the inspiration for Ludwig Schongauer's merchant, and in turn, the latter was the starting point for, a, for the character in Caverio's map, we could affirm that the cartographer used a motif that was undoubtedly exotic him to transfer it another equally exotic place, 
and in doing so, he was not faithful to the African ethnic or zoological reality, but was inventing them. Probably the reason for departing from the traditional elephant in late medieval nautical charts was not only to emphasize an exotic otherness, but also to highlight the importance of trade. In fact, numerous legends on the map place emphasis on the importance of goods and commerce. Nautical charts are, as we have seen, maps that invent the other in order to shape through subtle visual messages an image of the world of interest to the Western eyes. In this regard, I would like to finish with John Lewis Gaddy's assertion in his The Landscape of History. History, like cartography, is necessarily representation of reality. It is not reality itself. Indeed, if truth be told, it's a pitiful approximation of reality that, even with the greatest skill on the part of the historian, we could add, and the cartographer, would seem very strange to anyone who'd actually lived through it. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Sandra, thank you very much for this refreshing and somehow provocative approach to the 16th century cartography. Uh, well, nautical charts uh, were obviously uh, used for other purpose rather than just navigation. And uh, uh, we will start with the, the question uh, part of this, of this presentation. So uh, I give the word to anyone who wants to- Ricky, to make sorry. A uh, yes? Sandra left for some reason. You went down, so she left. No, no, she's already here. She's already I'm, here. Okay, good. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Back again. Sorry. Well, well, at the bottom of your screen, you have you have a sign with saying reactions. Then you can find the hand, either raise the virtual hand or your physical hand. For me to to give the word to you. Yes, Shima, please go ahead. Hi, Sandra. Nice to see you again, and thank you for this very very interesting and beautiful discussion i had a quick question and also a comment i'll start with the comment um i'm wondering this book i if you haven't read it maybe it could be interesting to you in this theme and more dealing with the iconography of clothing uh it's saracens demons and jews by deborah higgs strickland you know it yeah, I yes. was looking at the turban styles and my wheels were turning as I was remembering this. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Yes, it's a wonderful work. It's so it's interesting. Fantastic. Everyone should read this. Um, so my question then is um, kind of a pragmatic one. So I find it very convincing, the links between this woodcut and this manuscript miniature. But I was curious if you could comment a bit more on how this woodcut uh, was disseminated. Was it enclosed in a volume of a book? Was it sold broadly? Anything you could tell us, it's uh, very interesting. So th the main problem in this regard is that uh, how uh, prints were disseminated in the 16th century is quite well known for artists such as Martin Schongauer. Mm -hmm. So we know that his work is one, in fact, of the most influential in various kinds of arts, uh, not only cartography, but also uh, altar pieces, etc. But for the case of Ludwig Schongauer, we don't know uh, that much information. Um, I have not been able to, to find any hint on how specifically this, uh, so the life of this print, specifically of the one that uh, mm -hmm. interests me, the one of the merchant with the elephant, but um, uh, this kind of um, of, uh, of appearance in another map, uh, in this specific map, um, could give us uh, hints about uh, the fact that his production, as well as Martin's production, was very well spread. Mm -hmm. So they were sold uh, separately, and in fact, for for many of these prints, there are different copies kept in different libraries and archives. So okay. probably probably we could think that Ludwig, uh, I don't think we have still as much information to say that he was so well known as his brother, but 
probably he was close to, to the dissemination of uh, Martin's um, work. That makes sense. Thank you. And sure. thank you for the talk. Thank, thank you, Shima. Thanks to you. Anyone else? We have time for one more question, at least. Please go ahead and be shy. Okay, if not, again, thank you very much. Andrew, you. Andrew raised oh, yeah. his hand. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah, I, um, you were, uh, can you hear me? I okay, can't, yeah, yes, okay. I can. Hi, yeah. Andrew. <laughs> you, were, uh, you were talking uh, and using uh, countries and their names and everything to relevance, but as we look at Portland charts or a lot of maps, we find animal names being used to describe so many features. Um, I can think of Greece, which is where I uh, live, where we have uh, islands called uh, Pontiki or Rat. We have other islands called Lizard. If we look at the south of England, the uh, in, in Cornwall, it's, taught, it's called the Lizard. Have you ever done any study of actually how sailors related to the landscape using these animal images? So I have made a bit of research studying the, basically the, the coasts of the areas that have been of my interest. Basically, I've studied some toponyms in Africa and uh, in the New World, not systematically, but it is true that um, one of the main sources for inspiring new names for uh, renaming those territories where the, the impact of nature, either animal or uh, vegetable. Um, for example, uh, Green Cape, it's, it's another, another example. Of course, there were other sources, like for example, the, the, um, the influence of religion. In the case of Christopher Columbus, the first names that he gave to the uh, Caribbean islands were after uh, God, the uh, Holy Mary, and then the the sovereigns, the Spanish uh, Catholic kings. But nature was undoubtedly one of the most influential um, sources, and I have made a little of research, but not a systematic study. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to you. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Sandra. So we'll pass to the next speaker, who is uh, Corradino. Astengo will uh, a provoc pro provocative title in all false and made by idiotic people. Please, Corradino, uh, you have the stage. Thank you. It is well known that in medieval charts, the Mediterranean is depicted with its axis rotated anticlockwise. Even if there are some different opinions, the majority of scholars attributes it to the magnetic declination, or rather to the desire to make north as indicated on a chart to coincide with north as indicated by the compass needle, in order to facilitate the coordinate use of both instruments. Furthermore, according to Robert Bremner, the magnetic declination in Sicily <laughs> remained practically unchanged from 1300 to uh, 1550, ranging from 8 <clears throat> to 10 degrees east. According to a tradition accepted by many scholars, it was Christo Cristoforo Colombo who, during his first voyage, got aware of the magnetic declination and of its variation in the space. But from the pages of the journal, we have the feeling that the admiral and his sailors were not surprised to ascertain that sailing west in the ocean, the eastern declination was decreasing to zero and then becoming western. The sailor seems rather worried by the fact that the declination was changing in few hours. And it was the admiral himself to find the right explanation and reassure the crew. It was not the compass to move, 
but to the pole star. It is clear that in a century of Atlantic navigation, Spanish and Portuguese sailors must have become fully aware of the variation of the compass and of the apparent rotation of the pole star around the pole. And Colombo might have learned of those new knowledges during the seven years he spent in Portugal. The oceanic charts began to be oriented with the true north and also the rotation of the axis of the Mediterranean does seem to have been corrected in, the, in some large anonymous planisphere produced by the Casa de Contratación. But within the Mediterranean, navigation continued along the same routes and with the same techniques as in the Middle Ages. Therefore, the Mediterranean workshops went on depicting the sea in the traditional way. Even a cartographer uh, like Vesconte Maggioro was very attentive to contemporary advances and in geographical knowledge, persisted in drawing the Mediterranean with the sea axis rotated some 10 degrees anticlockwise, and then transferred his arrow to his lar large planispheres, even though he largely based this works on Spanish and Portuguese sources. The axis of the Mediterranean remain unchanged in all his works and in those of his successors, Jacopo, Giovanni, Antonio, and Baldassare. But the most important workshop specialized in a luxury production destined to members of the ruling classes, Jacopo Battista Agnese, in all his long and rich production, kept the rotation unchanged. Probably chart makers did not want to alter too much an image of the Mediterranean that was already familiar among their customers. The first Portland charts of the Mediterranean with the correct axis came from a workshop of Atlantic countries where the astronomical navigation was widespread long since or were made by Mediterranean chart, make, chart makers in contact with those workshops, like Domenico Villarolo, alias Domingo de Villaroel. With the diffusion of astronomical instruments, every pilot, cartographer, or cosmographer was able to calculate with sufficient approximation the latitude of different places of the Mediterranean. And sometimes a list of those latitudes is added to their essays, as for an example, L'arte del navigare by Agostino Cesareo of 1568. We see uh, Monte di Gibilterra, 36 degrees 30, and Alexandria, 31 degrees. Scholar and sailors of the 16, uh, sorry, from the mid 16th century, with the introduction of a scale of latitude in the Atlantic, innovation adopted by many chart makers, from Jacopo Maggiolo to Battista Agnese, the error became even more evident. Scholars and sailors of the 16th century were then perfectly aware of the falseness of the degrees of traditional charts as well as of the magnetic declination that was its probably cause. Even if for this last one, it was extremely difficult to make accurate measurement necessary to evaluate its variation in the space. In fact, the horizon of the mariner compass was divided in 32 points or rounds with an interval of 11 degrees 15 minutes while they needed an instrument, an instrument that could measure differences of less than one degree. Furthermore, the compass was considered an imperfect instrument whose needle could gradually lose its magnetism or could have been badly magnetized, whose readings could be altered by the smell of garlic and onion or by the presence of a diamond. And little was known how the compass was really working. 
Anyhow, it was a widespread theory among scholars of Sailor that the magnetic declination was about one quarter east on the coast of Syria. That was regularly diminishing towards west, becoming zero at the longitude of Azores, and then becoming western and growing regularly towards America, remaining unchanged during the years. Many scholars during the 16th century were interested in magnetism in the hope to find a solution to the problem of longitudes. Among them, even Gerard Mercator, who in a letter of 1546 to Perenot de Granville proposes a new method based precisely on the variation of the declination, method that he explains again in the Declaratio of 1553. Among the others, we must remember Giovanni Battista della Porta because of the exceptional diffusion of his book, Magie Naturalis. The second edition of 1589 greatly enlarged new 38 reprints in various languages before 1650. In the book seven, The Miraculous Magnetis, he disproves some old superstition, such as the influence of garlic, onion, and diamond on the cap compass. He is convinced of the possibility of solving the problem of longitude with the magnetic declination, but is fully aware of the insufficient of the instrument in use and proposes to build a compass of a five foot diameter, divided in degrees and fractions. Another essay on magnetism that enjoyed a larger diffusion was The New Attractive by Robert, Robert Norman, printed in 1581. The author informs us about the different kind of compasses in use in Europe. The author uh, in Sicily, Genova and Venice, the wind rose was pasted to the needle without any correction. But in Danske and in Flanders, it was rotated of three-fourths of point of rhomb, and sometimes of a wall point. But for boats sailing to Russia uh, of three halves, in Seville, Lisbon, La Rochelle, Bordeaux, Rouen, and in the whole England of half a point. The author states also that charts and portolani were made with the compass used locally and warns sailors against using one kind of chart with a different kind of compass. But the most important treatise um, on that subject is surely De Magnete by William Gilbert, printed in London in 16. 1600, both in Latin and English. The author states that the Earth itself is a great magnet that is responsible of the behavior of the compass. He is convinced that the observation previously made on magnetic declination were unreliable for the many reasons already listed to which he adds the use of different kind of compasses, confirming with some differences the statement by Norman. Apparently, to overtake the problem of declination, sailors from Mediterranean Europe had chosen to rotate the chart, while sailors of Atlantic Europe had preferred to rotate the wind rows of the compass. In 1595, Cornelis Cleanson in Amsterdam printed the card book, the Atlas of the Mediterranean, by the famous navigator William Barenson. The general chart of the sea, uh, work of the cartographer Petrus Plancius, corrects the axis shift in the Mediterranean and shows Gibraltar and Crete almost perfectly aligned while Cyprus is still placed a little bit too much to the north. The cartwork 
contains also nine regional charts. Five of them show two wind roses. Uh, the Directorium Nauticum Italicum and the Directorium Nauticum Vulgare or German Compass, who appears rotated of about half a point. One should also remember that while from 1300 to 1500, the Eastern declination in Central Mediterranean, according to Robert Bremner, should have been somewhere between eight and 10 degrees, during the course of the 16th century, this value began to fall, uh, fall so much that it was around four degrees in 1600, and this orthogonal zero must have passed through the Aegean. But this important change seems to have gone unnoticed by the majority of scholars of the time. Francesco Maurolico from Messina, in his Opuscola Mathematica of 1575, states to have learned with astonishment that on a meridian passing through Peloponnesus and exactly through the port of Corone, the compass pointed exactly to the north, and that on its east side, the compass showed a western declination. Then, having seen that Olaus Magnus, in his Carta Marina, place an insula magnetum um, at the longitude of 49 degrees east, the same meridian passing through Peloponnesus, he felt relieved, believing to have eventually found a scientific evidence for his observation. William Gilbert, quoting Mauro Lico and the opinion of Sicilian and Italian sailors, accepts the idea of the agonic line, the line of zero declination, passing through Peloponnesus. The agonic line followed so passing. Um, through Corvo Island, but on that meridian at the latitude of 55 degrees, there was a declination of half a romb to uh, northwest, and at latitude of 20 degrees, there was a declination of one fourth romb to northeast. In the words of Gilbert, consequently, the limits of variation are not conveniently determined by means of great circles and meridians. However, it, it does not exclude that with appropriate new instruments, the study of the magnetic declination could contribute to solve the problem of the longitude, also because he is firmly convinced that the variation of the declination remained always unchanged during the time. Two years later, in 1602, Bartolomeo Crescenzio's Nautica Mediterranea was published in Rome by Bartolomeo Mofasini. From the title page, we understand that it is a very ambitious work, a synthesis of all the nautical knowledge of the time that go from the building and equipment of the ship to the written portolano of the Mediterranean. Crescentius bases himself on the main available works, on personal relations with scholars, and on direct experience, matured in seven years of sailing, embarked as a hydrographer on the galleys of the Papal fleet. In the book two, the author examines l'arte del navigar l'uno e l'altro mare, the art of sailing the Mediterranean and the ocean, probably with the aim of unifying them. But for that purpose, he knows it was necessary to have at disposal corrected charts. 
while the degrees of Porto Lanchards were in all false and made by idiotic people. The chart made by Crescenzio in 1596 and lately inserted in the Nautica Mediterranea shows the axis corrected with a result that is quite satisfactory, but it is probable that the correction has been obtained simply by bringing all the relevant places to their correct latitude, while it is improbable that the author had followed the mm, complex geometrical procedure that was elaborated lately and exposed in the text. He thinks that the declination in Antioquia uh, was of two quarters, 22 uh, degrees 30 minutes east. But he declares to have chosen for his chart an average value of one quarter, uh, maybe to make the result to, to coincide with the one already obtained with latitudes. Crescenzio is also convinced that the magnetic declination could be used to solve the problem of longitude, because he believes that it variates regularly from zero in the Azores to two quarters east at Antioquia, the maximum value he thinks it could reach. Two quarters for him correspond to 90 degrees of longitude. The enormous error is evident. The Nautica Mediterranea did not obtain the success the author hoped. Printed in Italian, it was not translated in other languages and knew only one edition, that of 1502. The presumed edition of 1607, um, sorry, 1602, uh, the presumed edition of 1607 is just a forgery. In several copies of the book, the number two of the data has been erased and substituted by a number seven in handwriting, probably to make the unsold copies look like a new up-to-date edition. In 1635, Henry Gellibrand gave to the press an essay in which he demonstrated with sound mathematical basis the diminution of the magnetic declination of about seven degrees, four minutes in London over a period of 54 years. It was clear that the declination could not be used to calculate the longitude and that it did not make any sense to try to rectify the traditional Portland chart for that purpose. For another half a century, they continue to be made and sold mainly as decorative object or as a source of general geographic information before disappearing completely. While for the actual navigation, also in the Mediterranean, they were used charts made in Atlantic countries based on geographical coordinates and on new projections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corradin. Thank you. Well, you know how much I'm interested in you. Uh, for this issue, for this subject of magnetic alienation, but I will refrain from asking questions right now and give the word to the audience. Please go ahead and Corradino, please stop sharing your screen. Okay, all right. Please go ahead for questions and the comments. We have time for a couple of them. No questions. Well, uh, I have one. Maybe we'll trigger, we'll trigger the interest of others. And you know, Pohadino, that my, my, it is a theory of mine and I have written about it that they knew perfectly during, say, during the 15th and the 16th centuries that the orientation of the Mediterranean Sea was not 
in accordance with with the real orientation and uh, uh, because maybe nautical cartographers mariners are conservative people uh, charts just stayed as they were and they were only modified at the end of the 16th century my idea and my interpretation is that they coped with the problem in navigation by manipulating the buried compasses i mean by moving the the wind rows the, the cardboard wind rows on the top of magnetic needle in relation to the magnetic needle in order to put it in accordance with the directions uh, shown on the charts uh, could you comment on this please um well uh, um uh, Joao um, of Lisbon, uh, in 1514, I think, uh, complains that yes. unscrupulous uh, yes. <laughs> pilots used to modify the compass just to uh, make uh, it to coincide with the local declination. But was the name of the guy? Yes. Yeah, well, um, uh, the point is that uh, what uh, at the beginning of the century seems to be uh, an exception, something made by uh, little scrupulous pilots, uh, during the century it, it seems to have become a, a regular habit. Uh, unfortunately, few compasses have survived. So uh, I don't know if there is a way to check if they were really uh, modified uh, according to the local declination. According to uh, those uh, uh, contemporary scholars, it seems to be a general rule. Okay. Uh, maybe so called, I don't mean modifying in accordance with reality, but in accordance with the charts. The yes. charts to make okay, which is yes. different. Okay, yes, different. But uh, this is an inter interesting point. What the two uh, English scholars say that uh, the physical compass was modified and was, uh, uh, let's say, regularly modified. Those made in Lisbon, for example, were rotated one uh, half point. Those made in Flanders uh, a quarter, uh, and yes. uh, there is uh, uh, there are those uh, regional uh, uh, charts uh, by Barenson, which suggest in fact uh, that uh, they use a, a modified compass. It compares the Italian compass with the German compass with uh, a quarter wind. Uh, rotation. Okay, thank you very much, Covadini. Yes, indeed, you confirm my, my suspicion that, that all of them in the Mediterranean were, were manipulating their compasses for, for practical reasons. Well, I'll give the word to the assist, to the, to the present to the people assisting to the conference. Any more questions, I, please? Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment. I think Maybe Corradino can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe in Norman's text where he's talking about the different regions and how their charts are modified differently to reflect the declination. Doesn't he also give advice that you should buy your compass and your chart in the same region? Yes. And this is directly suggesting that these are made to conform with each other. Yeah, uh, yes, this is what is, is suggested. Yeah. But uh, uh, but we don't know for sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> well, uh, what I suspect is that in the very beginning of the of the, the marine compasses, they were not aware of the difference between the, uh, well geographical directions and magnetic directions. So the only thing they did uh, was to put both north in the corners at the very spot, the very place where the compasses were being made. 
Uh, only later on they realized that uh, it was not possible to correct that for, for the old and the twin. Well, uh, this is what is suggested by Levanto. Francesco yes. Maria Levanto wrote a, a treatise on uh, navigation and uh, in, his, uh, in his book he suggests in fact to verify every day the declination, the local declination, and to correct the compass accordingly. It is exactly what you are saying, but uh, I found this only uh, around half uh, 17th century. Okay. Okay. We have time for one more question. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, Run. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to Corradino. It was uh, it was very interesting. Um, I, I would just uh, would like to make a, uh, a short comment, uh, even if it's not related to the navigation in the Mediterranean, just to to signal that Pedro de Medina uh, in fifteen forty five in his uh, art of navigation already is concerned with the, the problem that, uh, that uh, Corradino mentioned about, about the, the, the needles and the, the, in, he, in his opinion, uh, pilots should not, should not move anything on the needles. So mm -hmm. let everything be as, uh, as, uh, as it was. So I believe that uh, even in the Casa de la Contratación, and of course for the Atlantic, uh, in this case, uh, it was a problem already uh, that was debated. And uh, I'm talking about 1545, I believe, like uh, you said, that even before pilots like Juan de Lisboa, they were, uh, it was a, a, known, a known effect and they were concerned about it. Just a small comment. And thank you again. I, thank you. Thank Great. You. Uh, just, I would like to add that uh, the... Uh, how do you say, the observation of the declination was very rare during the 16th century. We don't have many of those observations and mainly they are made in uh, big towns of uh, Central and Northern Europe or in, or in faraway lands. For example, in Novaya Zemlya, we have uh, some observation of the declination or in Indian Ocean, many observations. Very little in Mediterranean, nearly nothing. We have Hartmann in Rome, which is in 1510, uh, gives six degrees east in Rome, but he's the only one I know in the Mediterranean. Um, chart makers and in general cosmographers, they just assume that in Mediterranean, it was growing uh, from uh, from zero in the Azor up to one quarter wind to Antioquia yes. regularly, but uh, there were no uh, observation. They didn't measure it. Probably it was very difficult to measure the declination with the instrument they have at the end at the moment. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Well, we are happy now because we have geomagnetic models capable yeah. of, uh, oh, well, 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 of uh, determining. Of, uh, we yes. have all those by the, by the uh, National Oceanic uh, and uh, Atmospheric yes, uh, Administration. Yes. They yes. go back uh, to 1590, but they, they are useful. A lot. Yes, uh, uh, with real observation of magnetic declination, the previous <laughs> model is based on uh, on. Uh, uh, lava extracted and things yes. like that. Those used by Bremner were based yes, on exactly. lava flows of the Etna. Lava flow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again, Corradin. That was a magnificent paper, a very good paper. Thank you. Thank, thank well, you. Well, we are on time, so uh, I will give the word to Ricardo. Where is Ricardo? I can't see. I'm him. here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, very well, very well. So let me just share my screen. Second screen, here we go. 
So I guess you're all seeing now the presentation. Okay, so first let me start by saying that it's a big honor for me to speak to, to all of you. And secondly, this is the first time I'm presenting the, the database officially to all this group of experts. So no pressure at all for me, but I'll try to do my best. <laughs> so, okay, here we go. So back in 2017, when I started working in this, in this project, I started my work by trying to answer four main questions. So how would researchers observe nautical charts? Um, then, what were the available resources to study them? Were they digital or not? And were there any limitations regarding the use of these digital resources? And then, how could we improve the resources that existed? So, we'll go into these questions one by one. So, observing a nautical chart. So, there were like three main ways of, of uh, observing charts. So, you could examine the object on site, so go to an archive. Um, you have, in this case, you have to, to, to keep the, the track of the location of, of the charts, you know where the chart is, is archived. And then uh, access may not be immediate because you need to schedule with the archive and et cetera, et cetera. But this is the, let's say the, the, the most detailed way because you have the object close to you and you, you can do everything with a the chart. Then you can also use printed facsimiles. So in books, documents, prints, Etc. So they are they are like they're convenient, but sometimes they may not have the, the, the highest detail to study the charts. And then finally, we can use also digital reproductions. So this is the most convenient way. It's the maybe the, the, the most used one. Um, sometimes high resolution may not be easily available, and they can also be not very easy to find. Fortunately. Uh, researchers have developed some digital resources to help in the study of, of, of nautical charts. So there are like two, two, two main ways of, of, of helping with digital inventories. So usually digital inventories are censuses. So censuses of nautical charts, portlands, atlases. So they are, they are basically listings. Um, it can be on, on Excel files, for example, and they are usually maintained by researchers. And then we have the, the case of on, online repositories. So it's the case of, um, of, of uh, it's, it's one, one known uh, online repository or other museums or institutions. So I also have here some, some, some notable references. So let's say some, some notable inventories in the field. So uh, the, the, the inventory from Coradin Wastengu, Richard Svedler, Ramon Pujad, and Tony Campable. So these are well-known resources in the field and uh, very well established. Okay, but there were some problems regarding the use of these, of, of these resources, let's say. So data dispersion was one of them. So if you wanted to find a specific image or you, you wanted to see a specific information about a chart, you would need to know where that information is located, access the file or access the archive uh, repository. Um, and then this, this would sometimes create some difficulty to access the data. Uh, moreover, difficult, uh, the, the, the collaborative work was a little bit difficult because these were independent data sets and they were maintained independently by one person. So sometimes this, this would also lead to variable update frequencies, perfectly normal because people could, could, could not update it immediately when they had new information. And then because there are different people maintaining different data sets, you will also have multiple data semantics. So let's say uh, inferred dates, inferred authorship. So the way people would write uh, um, the, 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 the meaning of the data, let's say, it would be have, have small differences and we would have to take this into account viewing different data sets. So in the example of the, of the Excel, we would also have limited uh, data visualization. For instance, if you wanted to have a, an image or, or a chart map coverage, let's say, it would also be not possible, and and you would. This also leads me to the to the last point. Uh, some access limitations were also involved because you would need to have, for example, the Excel file, the Excel software, the Excel paid software, and then you would access it, and it would not be available immediately. Let's say. So, taking into account all of this, we have started to develop it, and now online, of course, the Media Chart database. So. This new system 
um, was designed to be optimized for research. So it serves the purpose of an internal research tool for the Medea project, but also to be exposed to the world so everyone can use it. So the main idea of this system is to organize information about charts in a centralized uh, way and to be continuously updated and the changes be immediately available for everyone. This provided through a modern and user-friendly interface with a flexible access. So with your browser, the only thing you, you need is an internet connection. So what is the database exactly? It's a browser-based application. So you, we access an URL through your browser. So it was built with open source technologies. It's compatible with multiple devices because nowadays browsers run in, in most platforms. So smartphones, tablets, computers, etc. Several people contribute to the platform. So there are several curators to the data. And we also make the, the integration of multiple technologies to enhance the visualization. So I'm going to give you some examples and a, a quick through to all of this. We use Google Maps, OpenSea Dragon and data tables. Okay, so really quickly, how did, did this whole development process started? So we sat around the table, we gathered all the information that we needed. So what the system was supposed to do, what it needed to do. And then we started the development cycle that it's the second rectangle we have here. So in this here, we, we started, I started building the system. We would come up with some test versions. And then when we have the, the, the first major release ready to the public, and this was in December, 2019, we launched the MediaShart database. So it's what you have online for today. Now, there are several people that contribute to this system. And you can also contribute, of course. The Medea team is responsible for the curatorship of the data. So insert data in the system with data sources that are provided. Our, collaboration, our collaborators also have an important role. For instance, Richard Fedler handled uh, lent us his census data. So we thank him for that. Once again, very useful information to start building the system. So, and also users can, can also contribute to, to, to data. They have access and, and to feed the, to feed the database and then everyone can also uh, give us some feedback so this feedback is used constantly to improve the system non bugs uh, errors in data or new data that comes to light etc so this is this whole process goes back to to the to the development stage of the system with improvements and then publish it online all right very well so now i want to give you a, a quick overview of our system so let me just open the browser window. Here we go. So this is live on this URL, there.fc.ul.pt. Most of you all probably all have already been here and uh, had a, a look around. OK, so this is the, the, the dashboard. We have uh, divided the data into four main categories, charts, atlases, authors, and archives. But charts and atlases are, are the most important ones. So below each card, we have the, the, the main operations we can do with those entities, with the data. Let me also tell you that we've added um, a manual of the system. So if you have any doubts using the system or, or any, any problem with something, you also have an information section here and you can also reach us. So that's perfectly uh, fine and we'll be glad to help. Also, this menu also uh, uh, is also present to the user. So for a quick navigation of the system. And another feature that we have in the dashboard is the, the, the chat of the day feature, let's say. So this is a way we, we've encountered to, to make the users explore a new, a new random chart every day, an high quality chart. And um, it goes straight to the, to the chart record page that I, I'll, I'll show in a bit. So uh, I've already logged in with a, with a free account, so you can have an idea what the system looks like because some features are only available through registered users. So let's browse um, all the charts that we have stored in our system. Here we go. So we are now we have now entered the, what we call the list mode in our system. So we have uh, an extensive listing of all the charts that are available. So this is accomplished with data tables that the, the plugin I've talked before. All of these columns were uh, were selected, uh, chosen carefully to identify each of the charts. They are completely sortable. So if you click a column, for example, ID, uh, you can sort it in a ascending or descending way. It works the same way for the other columns. 
and then the common name, the authorship, etc. We also have this small tool tip. This allows you to, to quickly identify charts with the image because sometimes entries may be very similar, let's say. And now let me talk, let me talk to you a, a little bit about the, the search feature. So in the search, we have three main things. The first one is to target any of the columns that we have in this, in this, in this table, let's say. And these are visible columns, but you also have the possibility, and you will see the separator here, to search for invisible ones. So you can search for lots of data, even if it's not visible in this, in this table. For instance, if you use the notes section, you can search for keywords, charts that have figures, that have wind roses, and uh, it's a, another way of filtering things. So it's very, very practical. But for today, let me start by choosing country. So let's see all the, the, the Portuguese charts that we have in our system. So let me type here Portugal for the country. Okay, as I type, everything is filtered immediately and we have the results. And then we have the advanced search. In here, you can choose the production range for all of the charts and you also have quick filters available. Let's say that we want to, to search for charts between 1500 and 1510. So all the results applied immediately, once again. And now because we want to see pretty charts, let's select the only charts with high quality reproductions. So we've come up with this listing. And now another important thing, because flexibility is important and we know that users may want to use the data that we store in our system, we have built this new feature called export data. So export data, allows you the, the, the opportunity, you can select all the columns or, or different, different ones, to export all the data that you have in this table. You have two supported formats, CSV or Excel. If you click on Excel, it automatically generates an Excel file. And there you have it. In a matter of seconds, we have an Excel file generated with the results of the listings we had. You also have a quick summary of the applied filter. So in case you, you lose track of, of the filters you have applied, so here you have the search parameters and the, the, the filters that were applied to the search. Okay, let's close this. Now let's open the shot. Let's open the beautiful continuum planisphere, well known between all of us. Okay. So here we have entered the record mode. So this is the record mode for charts. We have, I'll talk a, a little bit about reproductions and map coverage in a, in a little. So. We have like the, the, the metadata of the chart, so the name, the, the, the authorship, uh, storage information, dimensions, etc., etc. And finally, we have also the notes. So the notes, it's uh, more additional information that's written by the, the Medea project uh, members. Okay, so in reproductions, we always have, you have the all available images that are stored in our, in our database of the, of the current charts. You have this high quality, a symbol available when the reproductions are a quality. And we always have the source because sometimes we might not have the, the highest quality available stored in the database, but you can access it in the URL. The map coverage, it's the, 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 the coverage area, let's say in a modern representation uh, of, the, of the world. So the, the, the area that the, cover, the chart coverages. So if we click on the image, we go to the chart viewer, the high resolution viewer, we can, Pan the image, zoom very quickly, see the details of the chart, rotate it, etc., etc. So this is probably also well known from you from the archives repositories, for instance. All right. So because I don't have much time, we know we need to move on. So now let's browse the archives to see how many charts are available in Portugal. Let's say. So we go here, we select country, and we type Portugal, and then we quickly have all the, the, the archives that are from Portugal, let's sort ascendant by descendant by charts. Okay, so most of the charts are located in Lisbon. Let's open, for instance, the, the National Library of Portugal. And here we go. So in the chart view, we also make use of the, of the listings. And since we are here, I, I also want to show you the, the view, the record mode for the Atlas. So let's open this natical atlas of the world, the record mode for the atlas page. So it's very similar, it has the metadata, but now there's a big difference. For the chart coverage, because the atlas has multiple charts, we have several rectangles here in the, in the map coverage. So you have two ways of browsing the atlas. 
You can use these arrows to see all the charts that are contained in the atlas. You also have a listing down here, so it's another way of viewing them. But you also can use Google Maps and you can click on the rectangle for the area you want to see and you automatically be selecting the chart. So it's another way of exploring the atlases by geographical area, let's say. So this is another, another way we, we found to use Google Maps to enhance the visualization of our system. And now the last feature I wanted, I wanted to show you is the geographical search. So the geo search is an option that helps you to select a, a, a geographical area in the map and then perform three types of search. So let's say we want to see all the charts that contain the Strait of Magellan, for example. So let's narrow the search a bit here, the rectangle, center the map, okay. So here we go. Because we want a specific search, uh, search my, a more narrow search, let's uh, select for charts that are inside the, the, the search area. You can also select intersecting or containing, but it, it will appear lots of, uh, lots of charts. So we want to, we want to see charts that represent the straight and the So here we go, search. So once again, a new listing. So we have created a new selection of charts. And then we can also use the advanced search to say that we want only high quality reproductions. So here we go. All the high quality reproductions available in our system. You can view them really quickly. So the straight of Magellan, you can use these arrows in the chart record mode to see all of the entries that you have selected. And this is another way of exploring the, the, the charts we have stored. So we have lots of possibilities, but because today the time is a little bit short, um, I want to go back so to the dashboard. Now we can close this one and go back to our slides. All right. So after almost two years online, let's say, so from December 2019, so we have put a lot of effort into, into this system. And uh, the proof of that is that we already count with 5,600 and, and charts, more than, than this number, 3,700 3, reproductions, and approximately, approximately 600 atlases, 470 authors, and 400 archives. Now, we have also observed some interesting things. Uh, the, the, the most important one definitely was that this tool is already recognized in the community as a, a very valuable tool. So people find this a very use, useful tool. This between peers and non-peers, so people that are researchers or, or not. So we have received val very good feedback and thank you for that. Uh, and also users like to participate. We have several, we had several contacts contacts between users uh, allowing us to, to improve our system, for instance, giving us some feedback about bugs or share information about charts that uh, we have missing information or even reproductions. And, and that also contributes a lot to uh, increase the quality of the system, let's say. And finally, we also had the, the we tried social media and we also did a little bit of experiments uh, with, with our accounts. And we started by spreading the words, and then we, we told people about this system. And uh, uh, some, some time later, people started, it, it was funny because we saw that people started sharing posts with the links from our database. So people were pointing to specific charts on Twitter, for example, and saying that there is a chart in the system and started engaging in discussions. So this was also really, really rewarding for us. So finally, uh, we also have some future concerns. This is a, a, a list of questions that usually people ask when, when we talk about the database, we, people usually come up with these questions and they're perfectly normal. So what happens when the project ends? Uh, this, is, this is not easy to, 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 to answer because we will not be here permanently, as, as you know. But there are ways of trying to, to, to ensure that the system keeps running. So we could partner with institutions, for example, so the, the library or the faculty. And uh, we could also try to, 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 to bring up users to, to, to be curators of our, of our data. And um, this, this is also uh, challenging. And, and I would like also to, to use this slide for, for discussions if the, the audience has any, any, any ideas on, on how we could handle this, this, 
these these challenges, let's say. But uh, one thing is certain: we have come a long way, and we will we will do our best to maintain the the Media Charter base running and keep it a tool useful for everyone uh, to use. So, this concludes my my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. I'm now I'll be happy to answer all of your questions. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, okay, Ricardo, thank you very much. Before I give the word to the, to the other people, uh, that, let me congratulate in public the wonderful job that Ricardo has done in the last three years in making this dream of ours uh, uh, through. This is a valuable tool. This is a tool that is working and is being recognized by many people around the world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Ricardo. Okay, please, questions. We have time for about 10 minutes of questions. So I, I was trying to raise my hand virtually, but I don't find the button. Is it okay if I go directly? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so okay. first of all, Thank you very much. I, I'm a big fan of this website, as you maybe know from the user, user statistics. And thank you for enabling this export to a spreadsheet. I think it's very useful. So, so uh, that's a nice feature to have. So my first question was going to be, how do you ensure the long-term maintenance? But now I understand that that's what <laughs> <the progress. laughs> yes. So I, I look forward to what other, other uh, attendees ca can discuss about that. Um, the other questions I had was, um, initially, if I understand well, the scope of this site was manuscript nautical style chart. But I, I think that recently it has been progressively ex expanded. I, I think I've seen some printed charts, for example. So could you explain a bit what the, the ultimate scope uh, will be or, or what your goal is in that sense? So this, this is like a more technical question. It, it was, I think it was a decision of the, of the team. We started with with manuscripts, but then Joaquin and the team decided that they could also include the prints. So mm -hmm. we created we created several uh, types of charts because in, the, in those categories we, we have several entries for the for the charts. And then they started uploading more and more. So the scope of the system started to 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 widen. So I guess it was initially only for manuscripts, but then we I think we we rapidly. Uh, understood that there was some possibility to enlarge the, the, the data set and cover more and more charts. So it's also, a, a, I mean, it's, it's a great way because we, we have reproductions for everything. And then we also point people where to the archives. Hmm. So I, I think I can give some more information uh, about that. In fact, at the very beginning, we started on the manuscript charts, but then you realize that there were maps that were also important for the history of nautical cartography. For example, in the very beginning of nautical cartography, we decided to include also uh, maps, for example, the maps from, from Ptolemaic tradition. Uh, uh, another example, uh, during the, the maritime expansion, there were maps that were based on, on nautical charts that no longer exist. So we also decided to include those, well, uh, maps, not charts, during the, uh, well, the first half of, of the 16th century or so. And also a third, a third exception is printed uh, Portuguese uh, uh, charts and maps which, which are rare. And uh, that's why we have included them as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But those are exceptions, and we just have a couple, I don't know, 30, 40 uh, printed maps or, 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 or non-nautical maps. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, John. I'm seeing your hand. Okay. <laughs> Ricardo, you brought up a very interesting question about continuation of the site. I'm thinking of my side of meetings. Tony Campbell has his site with lots of information and there is no mechanism for continuing these sites. And I think this is something we as the map community have to address and maybe have a meeting where we can discuss this issue 
and maybe some group can take over to maintain our sites as time goes on. But it should be a person, a period, something to discuss at a future meeting, maybe at the International History of Cartography meeting or someplace. And maybe Tony can put it on the schedule for the ICHC meeting to discuss something like this. Oh, Tony is raising his hands. Okay, the, one of the problems is that our team, our Madea Charter team, will will be dissolved, will end in, in, in less than, than two years. And, and they can no longer be working on these things because they have their lives. They have to gain, <laughs> to, to gain their life, to, 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 to have a job, etc. As long as I remain here, as long as, as I'm able to go on and take care of it, I will take care of it. But I'm more worried about, well, in 10 years or so, how are we going? To solve uh, the problem. Do you think Tony has the hand raised? Yes, yes, it is unmuted. Go ahead, Tony. Where is Tony? Tony, your microphone is not on. We're not pretty. We're not hearing you. Neither your microphone nor your face. Uh, maybe we could, we could pass the word to someone else and wait for Tony. And then I also want to comment or make a question to ah Sandra, Sandra, but we, we can't see your face. Okay, go ahead, please. <laughs> so so thank you very much. I would like to to join to uh, Joachim's congratulations. I think it's a wonderful site, like many others that have been uh, mentioned in this workshop. That I think we have to make an effort to join efforts so that uh, we can give them uh, a, a very long life. So my question is, um, how did you deal with authorship? I probably, when you were deciding uh, what to include in the different um, criteria for, for the cataloging of each of the maps, how did you dealt with the, with the very difficult subject of defining the author of a map? So, um, for many of the charts, we have um, signature, but as we know, uh, we are not certain exactly if, for example, I'm thinking about Dalorto Dulcert, if it was the same cartographer, if it was two people. Uh, so how did you decide it to say, okay, so we are at ascribing these maps to Dulcetti um, or... Or any hints, any ideas you do you discussed? I'm I'm interested in authorships of maps. Thank you. I think that question is for me, Ricardo. Yes, yes, uh, yes, do, yes. But, but uh, do you want to say something? No, I mean from the from the developer perspective, uh, we we have always designed the system to have multiple authors, and whether they would be assigned or not, and uh, con uh, also have anonymous from different countries. But you're asking about uh, how how the team decided to 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 authorship some charts. So I think that question is more to Joaquin than me. <laughs> okay, Sandra. The, the quick question: We have relied on literature, and we have relied on the on the existing census. For example, the census of Corradino, the census of Tony Cantor, and mainly the big census of Dick Fedler, uh, where that information is already. In. We don't have the man enough manpower to to review those those uh, attribution. In a few cases, I don't know a dozen of cases, two dozen of cases, we have reviewed the attribution and they have assigned a new author. But generally, we have just followed what what's in the literature about that subject because we don't have uh, time for for more than that. But uh, Joaquin, I also want to add in that, and this is to Sandra, 
Uh, sometimes if an attribution is novel um, and we really want to sh shine a light on the person who made the identification and also leave the breadcrumb trail of why are we saying this is by this person, we have a notes field. Mm -hmm. And so in some cases, I will go in when I'm adding a chart in this kind of situation and give the citation to who made it. So mm -hmm. for, for this example, is all for sometimes. She okay. has already attributed the, uh, the, author, the authorship of, uh, of Agnese to a couple of uh, medieval nautical charts. We have one question from Paul Hughes. Paul, please go ahead. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, how do you decide whether a chart is actually signed? What I mean by that is if the chart is part of a journal and the journal's signed, but not not the chart, not the map. Do you consider that a signed chart? Uh, this again for me, Ricardo. Okay, in most of uh, in most of cases, when we say a chart is signed, there is a specific field for the signature. Uh, when we cross that field, it means the chart was actually signed by the by the author, and those are the signed charts. And all the cases, most of the cases where the attribution is firm. In other cases, uh, uh, the chart is not signed, but we do know who the author was. In those cases, we have also attributed the chart uh, without the square practice, uh, meaning that is an attribution. I'm not sure uh, I've replied to your question. Yes, I think you have, thank you. Okay. I have another question if there is time. Okay, one more, please. <laughs> so this, this one is more technical, I mean, probably for, for Ricardo, I think. Um, okay. I, I would be interested in, in having a feature, which is um, I often go check a chart and there is no image yet, but maybe one day there will be an image. So is, okay. is there a way to be notified when new images are added to the site or to a specific chart or I, I don't know, or, or the last... Uh, are images added in the last month or the last uh, week or something like that. that if, if that were, if that existed for me, it could be useful. Okay, that, that's okay. That, that's an interesting feature, but uh, <laughs> okay. So we, we would need to have a, a, a lot more of information to the database. I mean, when images are, are added, we would need to have a date when they were inserted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we do not keep track of that information right now. So unfortunately, unfortunately, with the with the data that we have stored in the system, it's not possible to do that. But that would be an interesting feature, I would say. Mm -hmm. We have behind schedule a very short one, Greg. Please. Yeah, I just want to note that uh, in 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 uh, what two years we have put in five thousand plus uh, images or charts. So that means you would be receiving about six or seven notifications a day. Mm -hmm that a new chart has been added. You don't want that. <laughs> that that well, sounds like anymore. paradise. Huh? <laughs> not <anymore. laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for coming for our first session. We'll have a break now.